So the title is AI for Pet Image Reconstruction, and I'll basically be giving you an overview of how we introduce artificial intelligence, also known as machine learning or deep learning, depending on which part we're talking about, and how we include that in image reconstruction for PET. So just to point out, I'm about to uh, publish a, a review article on this very topic, and a lot of what I'm talking about today uh, draws upon that review article. And so I'd just like to upfront acknowledge my co-authors there that are on the bottom of that slide. So Guillaume Corda, Abba Faz Marinian, Casper de Costa Lewis, Sam Ellis, and Julia Schnabel. So just to clarify that upfront. Um, so I'll start off with a rapid uh, review of conventional image reconstruction, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk about how we can introduce machine learning into the image reconstruction framework. And I'll cover um, three basic approaches there. And so don't worry at the moment what those mean. I'll go into those in detail. But just to highlight that I'll be uh, finishing on this topic of so-called unrolled iterative reconstruction methods, which um, embed deep learning inside conventional reconstruction. And that seems to be uh, the way forward for us in terms of practicality, in terms of benefiting from our physics knowledge, our statistics knowledge, um, at the same time as benefiting from deep learning so that we don't end up with this kind of black box um, issue. And at the very end, I'll give you an example of how we might take this forward um, for multiplexed, uh, multi-tracer PET imaging. Right, so let's make sure we're all uh, on the same page here with conventional image reconstruction in PET. There I've got that famous Shep Logan Phantom, just a simple 2D simulation. I'm going to take that as uh, what I'm going to call the ground truth. So that is the, the actual radio tracer distribution inside the PET scanner. So here, just uh, using a Phantom example, and I'm going to call that T to represent the true image, the true distribution rather. Um, and as you know, in PET, uh, we have back-to-back -back photon pairs being released uh, from that uh, radio tracer distribution. And we end up with typically uh, sinogram data for a PET scanner. And I'm showing that here as a noisy uh, measured data set M for measured data that comes from the unknown ground truth distribution inside the scanner. And what we're trying to do in reconstruction is to have an estimate, which I'll call X, of that ground truth T, um, but only using what we have, of course, which is the measured data M. So how do we find X from M? That's the reconstruction problem. What we do is uh, we have some model of the PET acquisition process, and typically in the simplest form, uh, we take line integrals, projections. So in other words, if I had some claim that I knew already what the image was at X, then I could forward model it using line integrals, as I'm showing there, to produce a model of the mean of the measured data. So obviously it's more involved than just line integrals, and I'm going to call that a matrix A. You don't need to worry about the contents for the moment. It's just a way of modeling our PET scanner. So if we have some candidate reconstructed image X, I can forward model it via A, and get a model of the data. And then we need to compare that model of the data with what we actually measured. And that's where this so-called objective function comes in. You've probably all heard of least squares. If you do a line fit, then you are, are fitting some parameters to data. And it's exactly the same here. Our parameters are, are X, the reconstructed image, and we're trying to fit those to noisy measured data M. Uh, in PET, we typically use not least squares, but we use something called Poisson log likelihood. But you can consider that as just a distance measure between the model and the data. And so I'll be using a capital D to denote a distance or a discrepancy between our model, the forward projection of the image X, and, and the measured data M. And then what we're trying to do in reconstruction, and that's what we've got this arg min, that's saying find the argument x, and always find the parameter vector x, which when you forward model it through a, um, minimizes that discrepancy or minimizes that distance d. And when we found the x that minimizes the discrepancy with the measured data, I'm going to call that x hat, which is my estimate of the reconstructed image. And so we do that via some optimization algorithm. Um, in PET, that's often something like OSCM, for example. And that will typically iteratively update X to allow it to better and better model 
the measured data or better agree with the measured data. So that's a, a conventional uh, view of image reconstruction. Um, but there are problems with that. Uh, the first major problem is that we are trying to find parameter, a parameter vector X, a reconstructed image, that matches noisy data. So it should be no surprise that if we do a good job of that, then we end up with a very noisy image X, which is not desirable. So I'm just illustrating that there with that noisy image. So often what is done in conventional reconstruction is to build in prior information. So I've added on to that distance D now some penalty term that says, well, yes, do fit the data, but don't um, fit it to the point of the image becoming too noisy. And so we have this kind of regularization. Um, you can think of that um, in its simplest form as what people often do is, is they post smooth their image to kind of compensate for the noise. But in a more elegant framework, we'd add on some penalty, some regularization. But if we do that, whether it's post smoothing or whether it's some penalty, some regularization, we do always need to find some mysterious hyperparameters. And what I mean by hyperparameters are, are, are values that we introduce without necessarily any evidence at all to say, look, it needs to be this smooth. In other words, do a four millimeter, four with half max post smooth or regularize with a value of beta of so much. And that is an issue. How do we pick those parameters? So these are two big problems, one could say, with conventional pet image reconstruction. And this is where machine learning can really help us. So what's the machine learning approach? Uh, it's instead to find a mapping F that takes us from noisy data M uh, to uh, the ground truth T. So you'll re remember in the previous slide, I mentioned the ground truth, but notice it didn't even enter in to the reconstruction framework. Whereas with machine learning, uh, we actually take into account knowledge of the ground truth, which we might have by a simulation or by um, a high quality, high statistics uh, reconstructed image. And what we're gonna do now is, as I say, find this mapping F which can operate on noisy data M to predict what the ground truth would have been. Now, we need to obviously estimate this mapping F and I'm gonna call it some uh, mapping F that depends on a parameter vector theta. So here I've got my distance measure again. So you saw it in the previous slide when we we're trying to fit X to M. Now what we're trying to do is find a mapping F parameterized by theta that will operate on my measured noisy data and deliver something hopefully that will be close to the ground truth T. Um, and then now instead of trying to find X, we're just trying to find the parameters of a mapping. So that's uh, find the parameters theta that minimize the discrepancy between my predicted ground truth and the actual ground truth. And this is assuming I do know it. And again, that's where we would either use simulations or high quality reference data for reconstruction of lower quality data. Now, uh, in supervised learning, obviously, we need to find this mapping, uh, one single mapping that will work for many different noisy measured data sets. And so that's what I've showing here, capital N, noisy measured data sets, each of them paired with the ground truth um, data, or sorry, ground truth distribution that gave rise to that noisy data. And uh, so now we're saying find the mapping theta, which when you consider all of the discrepancies between all of the ground truths and all of the measured data sets, best, um, uh, best, best does that mapping. In other words, minimizes that discrepancy for all of the paired data sets. And then the point is when we then do a novel PET scan where we get some noisy sinogram data M, we apply this mapping F and we can get an estimate X, which notice now, has been designed to really aim for the ground truth image. So it compensates for noise implicitly um, in the reconstruction mapping. So that's what I'm saying here. We're now, the benefit is we're mapping the noisy data M directly to a ground truth high quality reference. That is the big paradigm shift with the AI deep learning machine learning approach where you use labeled or reference data that is desirable um, by training examples. And then when you then test in a, in a novel case, we want to be able to predict what that high quality result would be like. Um, we've all done this before, just to point out. Um, so there I'm showing something like linear regression, just to say that machine learning is a very simple concept. Uh, typically, if you're doing some kind of linear fit, you'd have some kind of x-axis here. 
Um, that's your control independent variable. And then you get some measurement uh, values on the y-axis. And then when you've done that model fit for the gradient and the offset, that would mean whenever you've got some measured response on the y-axis, you could project across and infer what was the underlying uh, variable that explained that measurement. And it's exactly the same here now with machine learning, except instead of just a simple one dimensional variable in X and in Y, we're now dealing with whole images along the X axis, if you like, and whole measured data sets along the Y axis, such that um, we fit some mapping that explains the connection between those two. Uh, the idea being that when we have some measured data from a new PET scan, we can use the mapping we found from our supervised training process. So we just kind of, if you like, we just see where that uh, maps us to. When we've got a measurement here, we map it via that connection to find what the ground truth was that explained that new measurement. So really, machine learning, in a sense, is just extremely high dimensional uh, regression. Uh, so keeping it simple, um, we'll get even simpler in a moment. So don't worry if you're not following completely, it will get even simpler after this slide. Um, this is taking us from a noisy sinogram to a ground truth T. And I'm showing that we could in principle just design or train a very large matrix F, which operates on a sinogram to produce a ground truth T. And if we had lots of training pairs, then we could find F. And just to prove the point that that is of course going to be feasible, um, we just observe the fact that a very basic reconstruction method known as filtered back projection um, is an example of exactly that, just some matrix, some linear mapping operating on some noisy data M to produce some estimate of the uh, ground truth. But the point here is, uh, remember with filtered back projection or with conventional reconstruction, we need to choose how to denoise here it would have learned optimally how to denoise the data to best match the ground truth reference. Now, this simple linear mapping is actually what's called a fully connected layer in the context of deep learning or artificial neural networks. So we'll be going into more detail in a moment. But first of all, as mentioned, we'll make it even simpler and look at a, a very um, instructive example of convolution. Uh, now, instead of going from noisy sinograms to images, I'm going to make it even simpler and say, let's go from uh, aim for a, a noisy image M instead of a sinogram to try and match a ground truth T. So now we're just working with images, keeping it really simple. And here I've got three example cases. I've got a, a light level of noise, a heavier level of noise in my data, and then a case where it's a resolution problem rather than a noise problem, just to show you how flexible convolution can be. So what we do here then is we train a mapping, a linear mapping known as convolution, which in this case is just a kernel, which will take me from that noisy image M to best match my high quality reference or ground truth T. So you can see here it's come up with this neighborhood averaging kernel um, such that when applied to the noisy data gives me an optimally denoised image just by finding one single kernel that fits the noisy data to the reference. And in the second row here, I've got a much noisier case. And so when we train up the linear mapping, the convolution kernel, it should be no surprise to you that it finds now a much broader kernel, which will do more neighborhood averaging in order to achieve more denoising. And so you see here that it's successfully denoised that in such a way that it optimally fits the ground truth T. And then on the bottom row example there, I've got a demonstration of how you could also use convolution to find a sharpening kernel, which when convolved with that um, data set M will again match the ground truth T. Here, noise is not, a, not the problem. And so what it tries to do is to sharpen that to better match the ground truth. And you can see it's successfully done a kind of deconvolution with this kernel that now has negative values in it. So just to show this very simple example of convolution, by machine learning, we can train up very useful kernels. Um, convolution can do even more. Here I'm showing how we could, if we designed kernels, we could look up uh, edges. So if you, if you convolve this kernel with this brain image, you'll find it picks out edges. And if we were to threshold that convolution, you can nicely see the edges in that brain image. 
Or if we used uh, another kernel, such as this kind of vertical bar kernel with negatives either side, that would, uh, when convolved, give this kind of emphasis on vertical edges in the image. And if we um, threshold that, then you get this nice so-called feature map that shows uh, vertical images just as a result of convolution with a threshold. Uh, we could also convolve with some larger kernel like this that's looking for tumors. When you do the convolution, you get this. When you do a background threshold removal, you can see it's just correctly identified a location of a tumor. So this is just demonstrating how convolution followed by a nonlinearity such as a, a background subtraction, uh, elimination of negatives, um, can deliver so-called feature maps. And this is a, a manual handcrafted example, but with what we're doing in machine learning, we're trying to learn these kernels, a bit like I showed you in the previous slide, to, to best match some quality, some chosen high quality output. And that is the principle behind what's called a, a convolutional layer, where you just convolve with different kernels that you learn from the data, you do some kind of bias and some kind of activation. And I've just shown you that this uh, offset and this activation really can be considered as thresholding for the case of a, a so-called ReLU activation. So you can conceptualize these things quite easily. Um, here's a, a bit more of an extension of that previous slide showing two layers where what we do is we take a brain image, we convolve with three different kernels. Again, these are handcrafted examples, but in practice, they would be learned from data. They, do, they give some convolved output, which can be thresholded. And again, we can convolve those and then sum them all together to get some output. So in this trivial case, uh, maybe it's not as clear as the previous slide, it's just showing how you could actually locate a tumor. And if you so wanted, well, often, obviously we don't in PET, you could actually remove that feature if you wanted. And so this is just some uh, generic representation of a processing operation that has removed uh, that feature and just kept these features in the output. But here we have uh, a two layer convolutional network. And just to point out, we can define whatever output we desire based on whatever input data that we have, like that earlier convolution example for denoising and for deblurring. And uh, those are the building blocks of a so called convolutional neural network. Uh, here's an example of it um, for real data. Uh, this is FDG data. And what I've got on the left hand side is a, is a, is a low dose uh, image and then a higher count image on the right hand side. So my low quality data is my seam, if you like, my measurement M and my high quality image is the, what I'm taking as a surrogate for the ground truth. And then what I'm trying to do is find the parameters of that mapping, which as I've shown could be a convolutional neural network, a series of convolutional layers with, with thresholds and um, with biases and thresholds. Um, find the parameters for that such that you can map a low quality image to a high quality image. So I'll show you an example. Um, this is published recently, in fact, just this year. Um, this is one of my students, Casper Costa Lewis, who uh, used effectively um, a low dose PET image with MR information and also some experimentation with other processing on the input data mapping it through three convolutional layers where you're learning you know tens of these you know 30 40 50 60 of these kernels each time to constantly learn features which you then pass to the next layer and you learn more features pass to the next layer and at the very end you glue them all together and you get a prediction and the point is all of these parameters are optimized such that the output prediction best matches the high quality target so again, it's just a, an optimization of a mapping, basically. And you can see here, in fact, it does quite a nice job of denoising that uh, low dose input um, in a way that here it doesn't perfectly match the target. And arguably, we wouldn't want it to because the target itself still has some noise. Um, so moving back then to the more complicated case of sinograms, I've just taken a detour going for sort of image denoising. The point is that we can do very much the same process for going from noisy sinograms um, to images. I showed earlier a, a simple matrix example that um, could be inspired by the linear mapping of filtered back projection. But in general, um, we can build up far more complex and far more powerful mappings. And so this is a representation of a method published last year in medical image analysis by Hagstrom et al. 
uh, where what they did was take sinogram inputs, use multiple convolutional layers. Those are the processes I've already illustrated to you. Um, where what we're doing at the same time, though, is reducing the spatial sampling and increasing the number of features. So as we go further and further along, we're generating more and more feature maps using more and more kernels, but we're downsizing spatially each time. So really, this is converting the information in this sinogram into what we call a latent space representation, where there's maybe hardly any spatial information left in there, but all of the information contained in your pet data is now in a feature space, if you like. And when we're in that feature space, we can then decode it or generate an image from that same information. So you can view this kind of a convolutional um, encoder decoder as really just a way of changing the representation of your measured pet data. And again, this has all the benefits of the training I've mentioned before, where it would also uh, denoise uh, based on the training pairs. If you're giving high quality references, it knows it needs to denoise the sinogram to match the high quality reference. So that, that's probably um, one of the key examples in the world of PET at the moment for so-called direct um, machine learning or, or deep learning reconstruction. Um, but there are catches with those methods. Um, the main problems are the fact that we're now completely dis disregarding our knowledge of the physics. We're disregarding the fact that we know we've got Poisson distributed data. So there's a lot of research over many decades that is suddenly being thrown out by those direct deep learning methods. Uh, and as a consequence, they also need a huge amount of training data to learn from scratch all the physics and the statistics that we already knew. Um, so those methods are not ideal, and that's going to motivate what I'm going to be getting on to next. But just to also mention um, the other example I've previously shown, post-reconstruction uh, denoising with convolutional neural networks. They're relatively easy to train and use, but but notice we were operating already on reconstructed images and possibly the damage has already been done to the raw data by that pre-processing. So what is a better way forward? And that's what I'm going to focus on to, to finish off today's talk um, is that ideally we want methods that are going to use our knowledge of the physics, use our knowledge of the Poisson noise distribution in the data, use the raw data directly, and at the same time build in that machine learning concept of mapping finding a mapping that takes you from noisy data to a ground truth. So try and combine all the best elements of what we've learned over decades with the benefits of machine learning. And we'll find that by doing that, because we're building in a lot of our own knowledge, uh, we don't need uh, so much training data to learn these mappings. Um, and so that motivates what I'm calling here unrolled iterative methods, where we take conventional iterative reconstruction and we plug in deep learning denoising at just the right positions within that uh, within that process. So um, to motivate that, let's just take you through a, a very graphical illustration of conventional iterative reconstruction. There I've got a ground truth T, uh, radio tracer distribution inside the PET scanner. And I've got an idealized noise free measured data set that's kind of mimicking an MMR um, sinogram. Of course, there would be about a, a thousand or so of those uh, sinograms with a 3D acquisition. And what happens normally is we start off with some uh, estimate of the image. It's normally a uniform image. We run it through a model that's like that system matrix A that I mentioned at the start of the talk that just is meant to mimic the PET scanner and predict what the measurement would have been if that uh, image, that uniform image had been in the, the PET scanner field of view. And then what happens is that prediction gets compared to the measurement M just by a simplistic ratio. You take the measured data uh, relative to what you've predicted. Um, and that ratio, if you like, is like a correct correction factor in the measurement space. And you just back project that into the image space, which allows you to have correction factors to the image, which you can multiply. And we should see that, which will then update that image estimate. And this is the principle of the main reconstruction algorithm that's in use on the MMR scanner, where you have an image estimate, forward model it, compare it to the measured data. Once you've got that ratio, you back project and you multiply. And you just keep going around like that. And you can see that, say, for example, after 32 iterations, 
we've got a reconstruction of that image, which is great in the context of noise-free data. This method would be fantastic, no need to really fix it. But uh, in the real world, of course, we have the problem of noise as, as illustrated here, where if there's no noise, 32 iterations would look like this. But as we have limited um, scanner sensitivity, limited scan times, um, and of course, limited injected dose, then our images will be noisier and noisier um, according to reductions in time or reductions in counts acquired. And so that's where now we're going to embed machine learning in these conventional iterative methods to try and compensate for that. Um, so here is that conventional method shown again, just saying that we start off with an initial image, we run it through an iterative update, keep going, keep going, and we get more and more iterates and we end up with our result here, which would be very noisy if the data are noisy. Now, conventionally, um, we have so-called MAP-EM methods, or you could, you could post smooth, but that has the issue of how much smoothing to use. And likewise, these more elegant methods have some regularization hyperparameter that controls some denoising of the image. So this is a current image here that gets denoised. It gets uh, fused with the regular MLEM update to give a noise compensated update. And effectively, these conventional methods denoise, but in a way that, as I say here, is not likely to be optimal because we haven't got any of the machine learning information in there at the moment, no knowledge of what data should look like, no knowledge of what level of smoothing should be applied. So let's see now how we embed deep learning into those kinds of methods. We'd still have our, our chain of a sequence of, of blocks here of reconstruction updates. But now, just to show you what happens, at a particular step, we have some estimate of the image. And what we do now is we use our, for example, convolutional neural network to denoise that image. And this convolutional mapping would have been trained such that this particular iteration number should best match a high quality image. And so that's what I'm showing on the bottom there, conventional reconstruction with very high quality data where we know noise is not an issue. And that can give us a reference to train this denoiser to get that uh, potentially noisy image to match the high quality one. Once we've done that denoising, then we can use um, a constrained MAP-EM update that will take into account the data and take into account the prior information that has arisen from that deep learned denoiser. We combine those together to get an update and we repeat the process. And there are many different ways of implementing this. I'm just showing one basic approach, which seems to be quite effective, where you have this iteration dependent trained uh, convolutional neural network. And if you do that, you can get some quite stunning results on the other side, because we've now trained the very best denoiser um, from high quality reference data. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the area I'd like to really finish on. This is a, a method that is just uh, now available in uh, an IEEE journal, TRPMS. I've published this with my former postdoc, Abafaz Moranian, and that's the architecture there. It's basically what I've just shown you, but uh, explicitly now showing you the deep learned denoiser being made up of these convolutional layers with so-called batch normalization, relu activations, whole series of those to do the denoising um, and that denoising has been learned from high quality references. If we do that, uh, these are the kind of results that we get. So just to talk you through uh, the core results here because I realize my time is running out here. Uh, this is a high quality reference here, 30 minutes of simulated data. So it's already looking very, very good. If we do a conventional OSEM reconstruction of just two minutes of the data, you can see we get an expected noisy uh, column there for OSEM. And on the far right side there, I'm showing if we use machine learning in that unrolled method, um, that's the far right column here. I'm sure you'd agree just by casually glancing back to the OSEM column and comparing to the reference, that embedding deep learning denoising inside iterative reconstruction um, has delivered some very satisfactory results. And remember that this is still using the raw data. It's still using our known physics model. It's still using our knowledge of the Poisson distribution, but it's also got deep learning as well. So if you like, this is a form of physics informed AI or um, uh, yeah, so physics informed deep learning. 
Uh, turning now to real FDG data from the MMR. Again, we're comparing a high quality reference based on 30 minutes of data with just two minutes of data. And if you do OSEM from the two minutes of data as shown in that column there, and compare it to doing this deep learned denoiser, although I must say the deep learned denoiser is also using as much or as little as the, of the MR information as it needs in order to, to match a high quality ground truth. Um, you can see that if we're using the, the unrolled deep learning method, then we get the results on that far right column, which you know, hopefully you would agree are visibly much uh, improved compared to the standard OSEM algorithm, which would be in use on the MMR. And the far right column clearly compares very well with the high quality uh, reference data, which has 15 times longer uh, acquisition. OK, so this is now my final slide in terms of future directions, showing how these kinds of approaches might be used, for example, in multiplexed PET imaging. So remember the key concept with machine learning is the idea of having a high quality reference um, to train a mapping. So how would we get a high quality reference for when we've got multiple radio tracers in the field of view at the same time? Well, what I'm showing here is that you could um, have separate radio tracer acquisitions, and then we know uh, what happens in the case of one radio tracer. And then we do a separate acquisition with the other radio tracer, for example. And then we could easily add those two data sets together to, to predict what the multiplexed data set uh, would look like. And so that gives us, if you like, the ground truth information that we would need to train up uh, a quite advanced uh, deep learning mapping. So I'm showing here just uh, an illustrative example of what could be done, where we would uh, take noisy multiplex data uh, we'd run it through a network similar to the one I've just been showing before. Um, and now we would know that we need, to, need it to match this high quality multiplexed image. And then we could seek to disentangle those, uh, that, that single image into the separate traces. Remember earlier on with those convolutional mappings, I could generate multiple kernels, get multiple outputs. Well, that's what I'm doing here. I'm just saying, well, let's use sufficient kernels and at the final layer generate two outputs which are required to, to map to and match the single tracer images. So we could train up uh, a disentangling network. Um, and then once we've done that, we could combine them again and put them through and, and repeat the whole process. Um, and so this would rely on a lot of supervised data where you've got a lot of multiplexed and non-multiplexed examples from which you can learn how to both denoise and disentangle the multiplexed uh, signal. So that's just uh, an illustration of how these approaches could be used. Okay, so to summarize then, uh, I've reviewed conventional reconstruction and shown that the issue there is we're fitting image parameters to noisy data, um, not desirable. And then um, often you need to denoise, and in practice, we don't know how to denoise. You know, how much smoothing do you apply or how much regularization? And that's where machine learning comes into the rescue, offering this new paradigm of saying, well, don't do that. Instead, find the mapping that will take you from noisy data to exactly what you want, instead of in the other case where we're effectively estimating something that we don't really want. We don't want to fit to noise. Machine learning does what we want it to do. And then I've taken you through uh, a number of examples, direct mappings, uh, convolutional neural networks, and I've shown how you can embed convolutional neural networks inside current iterative reconstruction. And that's what we're calling physics-informed deep learning or physics-informed AI. So final uh, thank you to my co-authors on the review paper, which should be coming out in the next uh, couple of months. Um, they've helped with figures and so on. So uh, thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions at this point.